thank you for being here for the first seminar of 2022 uh, by ITE York University. Today, despite all the things happening around the world, um, the show must continue. But before we start, I just want to say my best wishes and prayers to all Ukrainians in the world, especially to our president, Ardon Solovey and his family. Um, much of North American society has been built around cars. Our cities are designed around them our economy is moved by them, but human error is always present and congestion is getting everyone crazy. Um, proper automation will allow vehicles to move faster and safer by removing the risk of human error. But are we really ready for this? Today, we have two experts on this topic uh, that, that can help us to answer this question and many, many more. Dr. Medic Nuranjad and Mr. Barry Kirk. Welcome to this seminar, seminar, gentlemen, and thank you for being part of it. Um, before we present our first speaker, I would like to remind you that you can use the chat for any questions and the speakers will answer uh, them at, after each presentation. Uh, you will also have the opportunity to speak and ask the question directly to our speakers. That's up to you. Okay, so our first speaker is Dr. Meghdi Nuranjad, who is an assistant professor at the Civil Engineering Department uh, of York University. He received his PhD from the University of Toronto and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Rodman School of Management for two years. Megdi's research focuses on optimal planning and control of transportation systems in smart cities with autonomous vehicles. His research on autonomous vehicles has received media coverage and is published in outlets including Forbes, Rodman Magazine, Global News, and others. Today, he will be speaking about the three C's of autonomous vehicles, comfort, connectivity, and collaborative uh, consumption. Uh, the, stage, the stage is yours, Professor. Thank you, Adam, I appreciate it. I also wanna echo what you said regarding the situation, uh, the worldwide situation right now, and that our hearts are with the Ukrainian people, especially since uh, we have somebody very close to us here, Artem, who is the president of ITE, and it's on all of our minds and our hearts are with you, Artem. All right, thank you, Adonai. Thank you for uh, doing this, uh, an introduction. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the species of autonomous vehicles. Some of this might be a little repetitive for you, but it's also very new for those others that have not really attended this talk. So I wanna talk a little bit about general what autonomous vehicles are and how they're distinguished from regular vehicles. I, a lot of times I really like to start off with this poster, um, which is a poster from the 70s of a family that is uh, basically around the table. Uh, playing a card of uh, a game of cards and uh, they're they have a tv in the back and the car is driving itself so even in the 70s people were thinking about autonomous vehicles and the, the potentials of transportation even though their um uh, their their idea of a tv was that tvs were still going to be in black and white but cars could drive themselves so this is an idea that's been around from as early as the, as the 70s and the, um, the initial thoughts of autonomous vehicles, even though at the time didn't lead to the technology that made it available, it did lead to some really interesting research that became the foundation of a lot of theories that we know about transportation engineering today. So what are autonomous vehicles um, and um, what are the three C's of autonomous vehicles? The three C's are connectivity, comfort, and collaborative consumption. And um, these are three properties of autonomous vehicles. And autonomous vehicles in essence are basically vehicles that can drive themselves by having sensors around them that allows them to see a vehicle's surroundings, just like a human being sees uh, their surroundings. And they have artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms that allow the car to replicate how a human being would drive and uh, it allows the car to move smoothly and efficiently. So these three C's, connectivity, uh, very briefly, I'm gonna talk about what these three C's are, and then I'm gonna go into the details of these, and I hope to create some discussion around that. So the first C, which is connectivity, is basically the, the ability of the cars to talk to each other and talk to the infrastructure. Comfort is uh, achievable with these cars for many reasons, uh, primarily because we no longer uh, would need a human being uh, driving the vehicle behind the steering wheel. And we're talking about the level three plus auton automation level when we talk about comfort, because the autonomous vehicles come in five different levels of automation, which I'm not gonna go into the details of today, but level three plus to give people the advantage of not having to be uh, cautious of the driving environment the entire time while they're driving. 
So that comfort aspect is, uh, is bold. And the last aspect is collaborative consumption. And collaborative consumption basically is the ability of the cars to be shared seamlessly amongst many people. And uh, this is also one of the capabilities that we'll be talking about. So how did the autonomous vehicles uh, affect the, how did the three Cs affect the fate of autonomous vehicles? And why are we really explaining these three Cs? One of the main reasons why I talk about these three is because I wanna talk about a controversy. Uh, not everybody is in favor of autonomous vehicles. Some people think it's good, some people think it's bad. Um, it can be a, a positive technology because it has the potential of making traffic smoother through connectivity, V2, V, V2I. It can potentially reduce GHG emissions by elimination of abrupt acceleration and deceleration, and it can promote collaborative consumption of vehicle sharing. So all, these are all really good things about autonomous vehicles. But on the downside, the flip side of the coin, you, uh, you may cause a lot of unforeseen accidents, especially in the initial uh, phases of the rollout of these cars. Uh, there's lots of liability issues and insurance issues, security issues that uh, there's currently lots of research on. And on the planning side, uh, uh, there is um, outcomes of these that are not necessarily uh, desirable outcomes, such as increased congestion and zombie trips on the road, which are basically the cars driving with, or driving with nobody in them and so on. So they have good components and aspects about them and they have bad aspects around them. Now, before I continue, I just want to ask you a really quick question. By a show of hands, how many of you are positive about the aspects of autonomous vehicles and see it as a good technology overall and are looking forward? How many of you have a good impression about autonomous vehicles? By a show of hands, let's see that. And don't worry about not putting your hand up. Uh, if you're my student or anything, I'm not going to get upset at you. Just, um, just let's express your, um, your honest opinion in terms of whether... You are on board or, or not? So I'll give you another 30 few seconds. Keep your hands up, please, so I can count quickly. I think it, I believe it used to tell me the count somewhere, but that's okay. Let me see. I believe it's uh, approximately 30% uh, are against and 70% are for, which is good. Typically in academic context, this is the kind of statistics we get, but depending on the type of audience, you know, it could be 50, 50, and in some cases you may even go the other way around. So that's what, what I wanna talk a little bit about today. I wanna to give you a little bit more understanding of this controversy. And um, basically uh, what our research tries to do is try, it tries to shed more light on this controversy and basically pick out different dimensions of the problem so that we have a better understanding of it. Keep in mind that uh, you are not the only people that uh, are thinking about this and have differences of, of opinion about it. When the autonomous vehicle spells rolled out in, um, in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, there was a lot of people wield, uh, throwing rocks and wielding knives at these cars because they were so, so against that. There's some reasons behind that. It's just um, uh, their general impression towards these cars as a new technology has not been positive in, a many, in many different cities. So there has been a lot of backlash about around these cars when they roll out. Whereas if you look at the city of Ottawa, the city has been a very open to these. We currently have test sites where we're, um, invest, where we're um, uh, running these cars and exploring them and so on. So different cities, different countries have taken uh, different sides of this debate. So talking a little bit about the three C's now, connectivity, as I mentioned, is vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle connectivity, vehicle-to-infrastructure -vehicle connectivity, -vehicle connectivity, and navigation. Vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle is basically when the cars talk to each other, and uh, it allows them to create these platoons, which is a group of cars driving together more smoothly. It makes them more aware of their surroundings uh, when they're able to share information with each other. And it allows them to drive more smoothly and have more well uh, efficient and orchestrated lane changing and, uh, and so on. And they can also talk to the infrastructure, which is the traffic lights and so on. It allows them to navigate better. It allows them to uh, balance the load, the traffic ro uh, load in a network better and uh, so on. So overall, uh, connectivity is a positive thing because it enables, um, uh, it enables a faster rate of data exchange between the vehicles, makes them more aware of their surroundings, makes traffic smoother, makes uh, accidents, potentially can avoid accidents as well.
So how does connectivity work? The cars essentially have sensors around them that allows the cars to see their surroundings. The three main types of sensors that they use are radar, camera, and LIDAR, and they have different capabilities. So um, LIDAR, for instance, is really, really good at uh, distance measuring and creating 3D maps of the car's surrounding, whereas camera is really good at object recognition. Uh, so a camera is really good at knowing what it's looking at. Am I looking at a dog or am I looking at a cat or am I looking at a car or, uh, or is it a shadow of a car? Camera is really good at that, whereas LiDAR is not really good at that because it emits photons, retrieves the photons, and it creates this uh, 3D uh, map of the vehicle surroundings without really knowing what kind of object it's looking at. It's really, it's really accurate in measuring distances with objects, but identifying what an object is is not a camera's best, uh, best power. And uh, typically, a lot of car manufacturers install all of these cameras around the vehicle. Um, companies like Tesla are leaning a lot more towards um, cameras, whereas, a lot, whereas all of the other car manufacturers are leaning towards both LiDAR and camera. So there's differences of opinion here as well. And once that data is collected with these sensors, the telecom infrastructure that's on the vehicles and, the, and on the infrastructure allows them to share this information with each other and broaden a vehicle's vision accordingly. So how does this affect traffic flow as we know it? This is a very uh, classic type of a diagram that we see a lot in transportation engineering, where on your x-axis you have density, on your y-axis you have flow. Density is simple, it's the number of cars you would see in a, per kilometer, you would see in a network, so it's the number of cars that you see, and flow is how fast they're moving. So this is called the fundamental diagram, showing that when you increase the number of cars, your flow goes up because you have a lot of more cars moving really fast, so your flow goes up. But beyond some point of density, your flow starts going down because there's friction between the cars. And this is a diagram for regular vehicles. And that's what we call the fundamental diagram or macroscopic fundamental diagram. With autonomous vehicles, the story is a little bit different. You can see that when you do the same thing for autonomous, when you plot the same diagram for autonomous vehicles, first of all, the variance or the, um, uh, that you would observe, the uncertainty that you would observe in the red dots are much less. You see that it's a more, robotic type of a, uh, um, it's, it's a more systematic type of a diagram we're seeing. We're also able to see that the maximum flow is increased and so on. So autonomous vehicles, because of their robotic features in an environment where all of the cars are potentially autonomous vehicles, you're able to achieve this higher uh, level of, um, uh, this, higher, this higher reliability in traffic and you're able to reach uh, higher uh, flows as well. The next C is comfort. And uh, as I said, they can potentially be more comfortable because they, they have more interior space. You no longer need room for steering wheel. The layout of the cars can change. You can now have beds, round tables, entertainment systems in, in, in these cars. And uh, you can sleep on your way back from uh, work, for example, and so on. And the implication of this is that uh, it's both a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing is that you have a better usage of your time. You're, now that you're driving to work, you no longer have to be driving. You can engage in some socially more socially beneficial activity, like uh, whatever it is you can do. And uh, the downside is that when you make it really comfortable for people to travel, people might actually travel more. And that can increase to higher levels of traffic on the road. And I'll explain a little bit more how autonomous vehicle can, vehicles can contribute to these additional levels of traffic on the road uh, as well. So um, other, in, in addition to the interior of the vehicle and the, the fact that they can be a lot more comfortable, they can also introduce driving patterns that we did not have the luxury of having uh, prior to these cars. And one of those luxuries is parking. Uh, in principle, currently the way we park our cars is let's say we're driving from home to the office. You drive your car to a parking lot, you park it there, and then you walk to the office. On your way back, you walk to the parking lot, take your car, drive back home. This is conventionally, this is how we've been parking our cars for decades. With autonomous vehicles, it's uh, a, a potentially different uh, uh, pattern where instead of driving the parking lot, you can drive all the way to your office, get dropped off at the curbside, and then send your car to park at a nearby uh, lot spot. And on your way back, you can summon the car, which is the terminology that Tesla uses. You summon your car to come pick you up, and uh, the car takes you from the curbside and drives you back home. Uh, with these types of patterns, you can imagine that the demand for curbside is going to increase rather than parking. 
So that's one thing we need to be mindful of. The other thing is this, although this makes it more comfortable for us because we no longer have to search for a parking space and we no longer have to walk from that space to our office. So it, it gives us that additional comfort. But at the downside, uh, these trips that we have in the middle, cars going themselves, parking and coming back, these are zombie trips because there's nobody in the car. And this type of a trip can actually add to congestion and the level of traffic that we observe on the roads. Additional ways that autonomous vehicles can improve parking is with the actual layout of the parking lot. So on the left is something we're very comfortable and we're very familiar with. You know, you have these islands of park of cars separated from each other by lanes for mobility so that regular cars can get in and out of their spots and they can navigate within the parking lot to find a suitable space. And, a, and on the right is a vision of how a future autonomous vehicle parking lots uh, could look like where you have mega parking lots with these many, many cars in them. And the reason you, you can potentially in theory uh, pack all of these cars in, in a small space is because uh, these are autonomous and they can be moved by a virtual agent. And uh, if for instance, a car needs to be retrieved but is blocked by other cars, you can have a virtual agent shuffle these around and take the car that wants to be taken out. I'll show an example here. Let's say we have this green car come to park. There's an empty spot. It parks there. And now let's say that uh, this, um, this other car wants to get out, but is blocked by the two red cars. You can temporarily relocate those red cars, release the green car, and then retrieve the two red cars that were relocated. And this allows us to, this reshuffling, because there's no need for an actual human being to be in the car makes it uh, possible for us to make more efficient use of the space that we have available. But you need to make sure you have sufficient strong relocation policies in place so that no car ever gets blocked by others. And the final C is collaborative consumption. Uh, there's lots of talk on how these cars are gonna be able to improve the way we share vehicles with each other. Um, and uh, the, the, advantage of, the advantage of this is that you can potentially get cheaper access to trans more affordable access to transportation because there's no, uh, there isn't a need for an actual driver to be in this car. So imagine an Uber uh, system where you, uh, where you request a car and the car that comes to pick you up, there's no driver in it. So you're, you're, um, you're eliminating the variable cost of paying for a driver. Uh, having said that, the actual autonomous vehicle does cost more than a regular car. So the acquisition cost is larger, but the variable cost is going to be lower with these cars. And that's why there's a lot of uh, move towards uh, using these as, uh, as, a, um, as a car sharing, using autonomous vehicle as a car sharing system so that we're able to leverage the driverless properties that they have. So that's a good thing. You know, sharing resources is always a good thing, but the downside is basically the zombie trips. And uh, I'll explain how the zombie trips occur with a simple example. Let's say you have vehicle relocation in a car sharing system. You have two uh, users are going from the origin to their destination. One way of addressing these two is to have a car present for each of them and have them take them from the origin to their destination. Uh, here in this conceptual example, your feed size would be two. All alternative would be to have one vehicle for one person that serves the first person. And then this would be a zombie trip. Um, sorry, I think my mouse started. Okay. Um, okay, so this would be a zombie trip from that user to this user because there was nobody in the car and then the second user gets served. Here, your fleet size could be one, but you would have some level of relocation required to, to serve both users. So there's a trade-off in how many vehicles you have and how, many, how much relocation you want to do. The more vehicles you have in the system, the less your relocation will be and the other way around. So there's a trade-off between those two. And this is a simple figure of actually a police car pulling over an autonomous vehicle that had nobody in the driver's seat although there's somebody in the back. So this car had nobody in the driving seat. The police officer pulled them over and was you know, faced with a funny situation of who they're gonna ticket. But uh, this is something that would not be too unrealistic in the future. Um, and it's a bad thing because currently our average vehicle occupancies are somewhere around 1.6 in Toronto, I believe, for cars. Uh, and um, uh, it's actually around 1.5 to 1.7. 
average vehicle occupancy. So you have a lot of single occupancy vehicles on the road. Whereas if you have these autonomous vehicles, your vehicle occupancy, average vehicle occupancy can actually go below one because you have some cars on the road that don't have anybody in them. And that's a terrible thing for traffic because you're trying to avoid these, uh, these trips that have few people in them. And that trade-off between vehicle relocation and fleet size uh, can be seen with a, with, from a study that we did on the city of Toronto. And here we show each of these dots represent one instance and uh, they show how much fleet we needed, how many cars we needed in a fleet and how much vehicle relocation we needed to do for different uh, levels of the demand. So this is 50 users, this is 150, this is 100, 150, 200. And you can see that this uh, slanted shape of the curve represents that trade-off. You can either have lots of cars, fewer relocations, or you can have fewer cars, more relocations. And as you increase the demand, obviously the fleet and the level of relocations together are gonna increase. This brings me to the end. This is a very quick introduction to what autonomous vehicles are, what their capabilities are. And what I wanted to do today is basically talk a little bit about these three Cs and how they um, are uh, characterized with autonomous vehicle movements. Uh, some of the findings that uh, I will just uh, summarize here is that with connectivity, um, although you can have more vehicles on the road when, when the cars are automated, uh, although the level of traffic can increase, our travel times, our experienced travel times may not necessarily increase because of the connectivity between the cars. Comfort means uh, that we can potentially see a lot more vehicles on the road and collaborative consumption can increase a lot of zombie trips. So a sound judgment of automation relies on the occurrence of these three Cs. And that's what we try to capture in our research, basically painting both the good side and the bad side of these cars and trying to uh, move towards policies that uh, basically emphasize the positive aspects of autonomous vehicles more than their negative aspects. Thank you so much.